Thank you, Margaret. That song uh, is the lifter of my head. Just to think as we're in the quietness, uh, just contemplating um, the greatness and the goodness of God, to know that uh, when we're at our worst, God is there, and he is the lifter of our heads. It's a beautiful, beautiful song there. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, you know, um, we've been kind of drifting, just going downstream. It's kind of nice, just kind of floating downstream. If you ever go tubing, uh, it's just kind of nice. You sit in that big, giant inner tube, and you float down river. It's kind of nice to just go downstream and go with the flow. But when it comes to what's going on and many things in the world, it's not really a good thing. It sometimes is uh, absolutely imperative that we go against the flow, kind of like the salmon going upstream. We've got to realize that the direction that things are going is not always the direction that God wants us to go. And we've been in a series right now, and we're getting closer to the end of this series in the book of Ephesians. It's been a fascinating time, and we realize that we are very special people, not because of our goodness and because of how great we are, because of what God has done for us. He's given us this wonderful royal position as his children, as uh, holy people, and he's just really set us apart for something special. And, uh, you know, as we get into, um, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of our Christian life, we realize that many of the things that God is calling to us now that we are his are very different than the world. The whole Christian life is a countercultural experience. If we follow God's way, we're going to be a light in a dark place. And we're going to stand out like a sore thumb. And guess what? Some people aren't even going to like us because we have such conflicting views, deeply held views that they have and that they possess. Perhaps nowhere is this more acutely illustrated than when we broach the topic of marriage. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. Uh, but the biblical view of marriage is completely counter to what is now being promoted in the culture that we're living in today. So the question I have for you is, um, what kind of marriage do you want? Maybe you're thinking of getting married. Maybe you are married. Maybe you want nothing to do with it. That's up to you. But when we talk about this very important institution called marriage, what kind of marriage do you want? If God is the one who invented marriage, and he's the one who designed us, it would make sense that we would follow his blueprint. So if you agree today with that, then I want you to look at what God says. We're going to look at some things because I want to talk about culti cultivating a counterculture marriage. That's what I want us to be. I don't want us to have marriages just like everybody else in the rest of the world. I want us to have a biblical view of marriage. Like I said, in the modern 21st century America, we are presently in the midst of a, a cultural shift. And right now, the values that, that God has given us and laid down to us and been passed down for centuries are under assault. All of the important institutions that God has bestowed upon the human race have been called into question. Uh, the devil doesn't like the way that God does things. He thinks he has a better way. Not only that, but there's this vigorous attempt to replace those institutions and those values with some new standards. God um, says there are things, for instance, as two sexes, right? Man and woman, male and female. But we have a, a perverse and corrupted society that says, no, we know better. There are not just two genders, but there are many genders. Uh, clinical psychologist Jackie Golub works for a private practice in Minnesota, says our society has convinced us that there are just two options for gender identity, male and female, based on biological sex. But in reality, there's more fluidity. Gender identity is on a continuum. It's not just male-female gender binary. There's a spectrum of gender identity. Most people lie in between the binary with personality traits that relate to gender identity, expression, and biological sex. Gender identity can change over time. Really? You can change, and it's not fixed, says Golem. 
Just because you identify one way at that one point in time does not mean you'll always choose that identity or that your identity won't shift and evolve. <laughs> I hope I don't wake up tomorrow and I'm a girl. <laughs> oh, you thought that was... So does my wife. Supposedly, this is the new enlightened thinking that there are many genders. So we now have all these different designations. We have cisgender. Cisgender, that describes you and I, who, who we align with the gender that we had at, at sex at birth. If the doctor assigns um, your gender based on your genitalia, then when the baby is born and they see a little girl with girl girl parts, then they say, this is a girl, and you identify with that. You're cisgender. I guess that's the only gender I would think. But then we have these other things. We have transgender. Those are folks who identify differently, and it doesn't match their sex that was assigned at birth. Then there are many others. There's gender queer, intersex, gender fluid, meaning they can't make up their mind. They're just gender fluid. You also have asexual, uh, gender non-conforming, gender expansive. Uh, I guess that asexual one means you just don't have a gender at all. Well, that's quite interesting. I guess maybe we are living in this world of machines. I don't know. But do you see what's going on here? Do you see the wild accommodations being made for people to define their gender however they personally prefer? And what they're really doing is they're redefining it from what God says. I'm trying to give you a little perspective. I, this is not just me trying to contrast made out of thin air. This is stuff that is being taught right now. The, these are not enlightened positions. They're actually deceptive lies that are meant to confuse and enslave people and rob them of their true identity that God gave them. But it's not the only shift in our culture, right? When it comes to this topic we're going to talk about today, the institution of marriage, well, marriage is not just between a man and a woman, right? Even though that's the way God designed it. No, 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 no. Now marriage can also between, be between a man and a man, or a woman and a woman, or a woman and two men, or maybe a man and four women. Who knows? These new, supposedly enlightened ideas are coming out of a secular culture and a secular mindset. And they're all being portrayed to us every day as normal. For many people, because they've been told it so many times, gay marriage is seen as an acceptable alternative to traditional marriage. And uh, these are the types of transformative ideologies that are being taught by humanist academia, and in many cases, godless atheistic teachers. And there is a, 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 what is a concerted effort being made to perpetuate the idea that these types of arrangements are actually quite normal, must be fully embraced and accepted in our society, and these values are being encouraged all the way down to our youngest children. Uh, you can even see it in the programs that used to be innocuous. I mean, programs such as the new Sesame Street and their characters they have on today recently there was a new family that stopped by Sesame Street during Pride Month featuring two gay fathers, Dave and Frank, with their daughter Mia, all together for Family Day on Sesame Street. And the message was that we're, there are all different kinds of families, and what makes us a family is simply that we love each other. As long as you love each other, that's just fantastic. Now, I'm not um, being judgmental. I'm just saying God has a definition and we don't have the prerogative to change God's definition. So if we look back in Ephesians, we see what God prescribes for believers. Last week we talked, um, just as a little review, we talked about being filled with the Spirit, right? God desires something more for us than just to be saved. He wants us to learn what it means to, to walk in the Spirit, to to abide in the Spirit and in the power of the Spirit and to yield ourselves to His will in our lives. That's what He desires for us. That's His greatest, highest purpose is that He would conform us to the image of Christ. He would fill us with His presence in such a powerful way 
in such a, a real way that we would be dynamos for him. And guess what? As, as you walk in the Spirit, God will produce the fruit of the Spirit. And it will demonstrate and manifest itself in a transformed life. Your life is going to be different. When you get saved, he doesn't just make some much-needed repairs. He doesn't just put you on the mend. The moment you believe we begin this new life in Christ, it's a whole new you. You're not just tinkering on the edges. Um, there's a guy, Lance B. Latham, one of my heroes in the faith. Lance uh, was my mentor, uh, one of my mentors I had growing up. I had a very wonderful heritage. Here's his, his uh, biographies. Anybody want to read a biography on Lance B. Latham? What a life. What a life, what a life, uh, not just a dignified life, but a fruitful life. God used him in such amazing ways. And one of the things that he said, that, and he made such a huge impact for Christ, but he said the Christian life is a miracle life as the Holy Spirit works this miracle in our life. And he used to say, you know, God wants to do a miracle in us. In other words, God wants to do something absolutely supernatural that can only be explained by the Spirit of God. So the Christian life isn't some attempt to just self-reform, but it's this wonderful overflow of the work of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. And his testimony, if you, if you read this, is just proof of what God can do for any man or woman who is fully yielded to God. God can do some wonderful things in your life. And that resonates to this day. And I'll tell you, when it comes to this issue of marriage, uh, Paul is exhorting them. He says, I want to talk to you now about your relationships. And he's going to get specific. And this is going to take us being yielded to the power and the insight of God himself that we can have marriages that are designed the way he wanted them. So if you have a Bible, we're going to pick it up. Let me just start in verse 21. Let me read some verses for you here. Um, and uh, we're going to get into this. It says in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. It says, be subject to one another. Hmm. And then he gets a little more specific. He says, wives, be subject to your own husbands. As to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. And then verse 24 says, But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And the guys are going, Yeah, that's right. Be subject to the husbands. <laughs> But then he turns to the husbands, verse 25, and he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So here we have these two admonitions given specifically to husbands and to wives. And they are the foundation principles for Christian marriage. These are some distinctives, unique distinctives, that when fully understood run counter to popular notions of marriage that we hear these days. And the first of them is submission. Nobody likes that word. It's worth noting that he prefaced his remarks to the man and the woman, to the husband and the wife, by saying in verse 21, be subject to one another. And this is important. This is a critical observation. What does it mean to be subject to one another? To submit or to, to subject yourself to someone else is to place yourself under another person. Submission to authority is normal. It's actually part of God's design. It's everywhere in our society. We all have someone that we have to submit to, right? Submission to the government, submission to the police, to our boss. Kids have to submit to their parents. But for the Christian, there's even a higher calling it says here that we are supposed to subject ourselves, submit to one another. So there is this, this concept that goes parallel, this mutual submission where we must recognize our need 
for one another and recognize our need to serve one another. It's a, it's a distinction of the Christian life to be selfless and to defer to the needs of others. It's not about you. It's really different once you become saved. In a very real sense, we're all servants, and uh, the, the only thing that we are called to do is to die to self. And that will only occur, this selfless life, when we die to self. And I want to speak to the issue of, of this dying to self, because uh, I think, especially as it relates to marriage, it's essential. When you die to self, you are basically escorting that selfish old man inside of you, the flesh, to the executioner. You're looking him in the eye and you're saying, listen, I must rid myself of you. I can't allow anything to get in the way of being one with my mate. You have to die you, I'm going to kill you. You have to die to self. You have to die to the self. You must die so that we can experience the marriage that God designed. That's, that's in, in essence, what dying to self is. This needs to happen because being one is the whole goal of marriage. If you want to have a biblical marriage, the whole principle, the whole foundation is built on this concept of being one, oneness. It's key. Oneness is God's ideal. Way back in the Garden of Eden, God said what? And he quotes this a couple of verses later, but in Genesis he says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's the principle. That's the concept that God has. He hasn't changed that concept. So, so when, when a husband and wife die to self, they are removing all those things that could possibly divide them. And now their focus is on harmony and oneness. And I admit, to die to self can be a very painful process. And it's definitely a countercultural concept. To say you're going to kill the flesh or mortify the flesh and, and put your own needs last, I mean, we want it center stage, don't we? I mean, that's what we all want. If you listen to the world, they, they tell us constantly, you have to love yourself first. It's about me. I have to make myself happy before I can make anybody else happy. <laughs> really. Whitney Houston Oh, we all love Whitney Houston's voice, right? She, her famous song, The Greatest Love. It's a great title, but did you ever listen to the words? I mean, I know it sounds, oh, so inspirational. She's going to sing about the greatest love, right? But here's, here's some of the words that she has. Everybody's searching for a hero. People need someone to look up to. I never found anyone who fulfilled my need. A lonely place to be, so I learned to depend on me. What a, what a sad commentary to never find anyone who could fulfill her needs and anyone who she could depend on. Could it be, maybe there's a hint here, there's some element of pride going on, but she goes on, she goes, I decided long ago, I'm not going to sing it, <laughs> never to walk in anyone's shadow. You, you seriously, God forbid we put anyone ahead of ourselves, because that's what it would be, right? To walk in someone's shadow. Oh, I got to be first. And then she goes, and if I fail, if I succeed, at least I lived as I believe. Because, you know, you know better than everybody else what, how you can be successful, right? No matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity. You know, it sounds so, oh, we have to have self-care. I guess that's a term that they use, right? But, the, you know, the Christian life is not about self-exaltation, but humbling yourself before God and others. That's the whole model that Christ has given. If you listen to the lyrics, there are a lot of I's and a lot of me's, but I don't hear any we's in this song. Then she goes on. This is the, 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 the crescendo here. Because the greatest love of all is happening to me. Here she is. She's going to tell the greatest love of all. I found the greatest love of all inside of me. The greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself 
is the greatest love of all. Really? Love yourself. I, man, I don't know. I have a hard time liking myself, much less loving myself. But that's not the biblical concept that we bring into a marriage that makes us have a, 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 a thriving, abundant relationship. James 4, 6 says, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but he what? He gives grace to the humble. God is looking for us to humble ourselves in our relationship to him, and he's looking for us to humble ourselves in our relationships with one another. If you jump down to verse 10, in that same chapter in James, it says, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will do what? He will exalt you. You know, we're all looking to, to get a pat on the back, and God says, humble yourself. In due time, I will recognize your faithful service. It might not happen until the judgment seat of Christ when you get rewarded, but guess what? God will remember. But in the meantime, humble yourself. So going back to this passage in, in Ephesians, Paul is specifically saying to the wives, after he talks about subjecting ourselves to one another, this is a general concept a general principle we all should apply. He goes back and he specifically says to the wives, be subject to your own husband. So yes, there's mutual submission, but there's also this specific command, and you can't just, you can't just scratch it out, ladies, out of the Bible. It's given to wives toward their husband. Women, I know you're cringing. No, you're not. Because if... If we understand this concept of submission properly, and it's understood the way God really designed it, I doubt that you would feel uncomfortable. So before we go any further, let me just clarify what biblical submission is not. Just kind of get all this off the table so you don't have any of these false notions. Biblical submission is not saying that women are inferior or that they have no rights. That's not biblical submission. Women are equal to men. Their value is unquestioned. It says in the Bible that we are all created in the image of God, men and women. So it's not an issue of, of value or about equality. Uh, when we talk about biblical submission, it's not saying that women have to be forced to comply with their husbands at every whim that they have. You're not, women are not slaves, in other words, all right? Biblical submission does not mean that wives are not entitled to have an opinion or that their husbands are always right. It's clear that our wives were given to us to help us to see, guys, listen to this, our wives were given to help us to see the blind spots in our own life, and so we need their wisdom and their input. And we all know that husbands are not always right. I mean, this clearly isn't true. You can just ask my wife. She'll tell you, right? Biblical submission is, does not mean that women must do whatever their husbands tell them to. If your husband tells you to do something that's sinful, it's never acceptable. You should always obey God rather than men. This is not an absolute thing. And, and then here's another important one. Biblical submission does not mean that women must submit to all men. Everybody doesn't have a right to tell you what to do. It says in, specifically in the passage, it's, it makes it clear that they are to submit to their husband. So all of these twisted views of submission are out there. And is it any wonder why people repel when they hear the word? Biblical submission is this. You can write it down. I should have put it on the screen, but you can listen to it. Biblical submission is when a wife voluntarily willingly, freely, without compulsion, chooses to place herself under the authority of her husband's headship. It's not something where you have to twist their arm. They have come freely saying, I'll follow you wherever you lead. Biblical submission is when out of obedience to God's word and his model that he has given, the wife places herself under her husband's authority. She understands he's not perfect, but that God has given each one of them um, uh, different roles in this covenant relationship, and his is to lead, right? So she is there to support him and, 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 and for, 
for this wonderful thing that happens as she does that, uh, they both seek to glorify God in the process of their marriage. But now we want to turn. So we've got women. We got you out of the way. Right? You're going to be there and follow your husband, support them, and uphold them, and submit. But then we have this second admonition, and that is unconditional love. Look at that verse again in verse 25, guys. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is an image. He's showing that this picture of the husband and wife in a, in a, in a human marriage is a, a, an illustration of the church uh, and the bride, which is the bride and the bridegroom, which is Christ. Christ and the church. This is, this is God saying he's calling us to, to live as men like an example that Christ gave to us. God is calling us to show a love that is so much deeper than the world's definition of love. The world's defini definition of love is a very shallow, selfish love. This love in this passage is not a feeling, and this love is not based on some passion or physical attraction. Our, our love for our wife may be accompanied by warm, fuzzy feelings and physical affection, but biblical love here in this passage is He's describing this selfless commitment to the other person regardless of how it could affect us, regardless of what they do for us, in spite of sometimes what they do for us. It's actually about considering her as more important than you. That's what biblical love is, is for a husband and of a wife. So let me review the, lot, the wife, she dies to self by giving up her independence and saying, I'm going to let you lead. It can be hard, too, if you're married to a deadbeat husband who's not living up to his end of the bargain. But nonetheless, she's doing it out of obedience to Christ. She's dying to self. And the husband, the husband dies to self in that he loves his wife so completely and fully that he literally is giving up himself. He relinquishes his selfish needs and wants for the welfare of his wife. It's a high, lofty aspiration. Hopefully she likes football, but he, it might mean turning the game off on TV so I can focus on her, right? There might be a time comes where, where she wants you to listen to her, and it's going to have to take precedence to listen to her over the game. Maybe she'll say, I got to talk to you, honey, but let's watch the Bears first. I don't know. I don't know. You might get someone who doesn't like sports, and that's just the risk you're going to have to take. But it's about putting her needs above your own. And that's what Christ did for us, right? It's really a self-emptying. Uh, he, he says in uh, Philippians, he emptied himself and became a what? A bondservant. In Philippians 2.8. It says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, there's that word humble again, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here we see this picture of Christ. He, he gives the ultimate sacrifice. He literally dies for mankind so that he could atone for our sins. And it's the greatest act of service ever displayed right there, and it was on the cross. And he did it willingly, he wasn't coerced, he did it willingly out of his great love. His love is what constrained him. So we have these two commands, and if we apply them, we have oneness. You have this, this submission willingly, and you have this love unconditionally. And the wife goes on, if you look at verse 33, it says, to submit again, to defer to the leadership of the husband. And later it ties it in with this concept. It says, let me verse 33. It says, Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself. There you go, guys. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. This is the manifestation of it, of, of, of implementing God's design. I think you would find it very difficult to submit to your husband if you don't respect him. 
And it would be very difficult for you to submit to your husband if he doesn't love you. That word respect denotes a sense of awe. It means to revere. I mean, you're not supposed to worship him. That's not what he means. But respect means giving him proper honor. Uh, and maybe not so much him personally, but maybe even his role as a husband and the head of a home. Showing respect for the position, even if the husband fails to live up to that position. Respect is usually in response to a man showing love to his wife. So I'll respect you if then you, sh you really, you know, man up and start acting like a man. Then I'll, I'll respect you. But if not, it's always the whole thing about respect is earned. But here, this is not really a biblical concept. It's saying, I want you to submit, and I want you to respect your husband out of obedience to Christ, regardless of whether he deserves it. But it goes in the same way for the men. If you really want the, the, the woman to want, if you want her to follow you, you have to show that you are trustworthy. You have to be this uh, person who says, I... I I, I, I would do anything for you. I would die for you. I'd take a bullet for you. And uh, then she'll say, I'll trust God by submitting to my husband. I will do this because I have no problem because I know he's faithful and he's going to provide for me. So it goes in hand in hand. All these concepts, the more that you uh, love your wife, the more they're going to want to follow you. The more that they're, they're going to want to subject themselves to your leadership, the more that they're, they're going to want to respect you. But even if they don't act like it, women, do it anyway. And guys, even if you don't get any response back, do it anyways. Love your wife. God says this is a better way. There's a better way here. You know, um, there's so much. I could just, I, I think I'll just, we'll just close it off at this point. Uh, but I just want you to think about something this is a wonderful picture that Christ has displayed for us. When Christ came to the earth, he lived this life as a perfect, sinless, spotless man. And then when Christ died, his death accomplished something absolutely spe spectacular in that it, it, it allowed this holy God to liberate and forgive sinful men so unworthy without compromising his attribute of justice. He was able to both maintain his justice as well as show his love at the same time. His love constrained him to die for us so that we could live. Do you want to really build up your wife's husbands? Let's love like Christ loved. In a very real sense, Christ died to self. He set aside his rights as a sinless, incarnate person and instead allowed himself to be treated like a wretched criminal for you and for me. And so as, as husbands, I'm, I'm really encouraging us to take the lead and to, to lead by example and to love our wives like Christ loved the church and to give ourselves completely and wholly and maybe some of you aren't married yet. Well, one day you might. One day you might get married. And uh, are these the things that you're going to want to be the hallmarks of your relationship? I, I, I hope that we would be stunning examples of Christ-like, unconditional love to our mate. And uh, there's so much more we could say about this, but let, let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you, I thank you for giving us um, your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that he gave us uh, the greatest gift of all, which was this uh, immense, overwhelming display of love. Uh, and it, it, wasn't, um, it, it wasn't because he loved himself. <laughs> it was because he loved us that he was motivated. The love of God constrained him. Uh, to go to that cross. And I pray, Lord, that um, we, um, out of our, our changed life, because of what you've done for us, that we would also love in the same way, Father. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to love like you loved. And so I pray for that, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for all this in Christ's name. Amen.